quite incredible. New York City, Srila Prabhupada established the Krishna Conscious Movement to 26-2nd Avenue. But it was there in the heart of Haight-Ashbury, the highest place of pilgrimage for the counterculture of the 1960s, that actually Krishna Consciousness became known to all of America from nothing because of these devotees incredible devotion they saw that Prabhupada could do anything nothing was impossible and they took that spirit and did the impossible Srila Prabhupada was so pleased with them and he had such faith in them At that time, now, there were three married couples. Srila Prabhupada sent them to London. They went to Montreal to get Srila Prabhupada's blessings. And from there, when they arrived in London, they knew no one, they had nothing, except fearless enthusiasm to serve. They were living scattered out in different places. Sometimes they were trying to get jobs. Sometimes they were having little kirtans. Sometimes they were meeting. It was very difficult. They were in poverty. How they even got into London was extraordinary. Srila Prabhupada when he talked about these three Grihasta families, he said, these three families are as good or better than sannyasis, as far as their fearless, empowered capacity to spread Krishna consciousness. Because no one had ever done it in, an, in a substantial way in London. And when they found out that Shamsunda wrote a letter to Prabhupada, or he talked to him something, because there's a letter from Srila Prabhupada to Mukunda Maharaj, where Prabhupada said, Shamsunda wants to give Krishna consciousness to the Beatles. I think it's a good idea. What do you think? <laughs> the most famous people in the planet. They had so many people screaming during their concerts in, in some sort of um, ecstasy of whatever, <laughs> that they couldn't even hear themselves play. <laughs> Nobody in the history of the world ever affected people like the Beatles. So they didn't even go public. They just sat in their studios and made records and everything that they made was go right to become number one. So very hard to meet them. So Yamuna Devi, Malati Devi, and Janaki Devi, they had this strategy because the Beatles owned a record company called Apple Records. So they started sending different preparations made out of apples. <laughs> yeah? I don't remember what they all, you know, apple cookies, apple pies, apple crisps, apple crunch, apple um, pudding. They just kept making different apple things. And, you know, it began, the workers were eating, but then it was so, everything was so ecstatically nice because it was all offered to Krishna with love and devotion. And it was empowered by Srila Prabhupada and Yamuna Devi and Malati Devi and Janaki. They were excellent cooks because they so wanted to please Prabhupada so deeply that eventually the Beatles were eating it every day. <laughs> And we know the story how, Shula, how Shamsundar Prabhu got in to meet George Harrison and became his very best friend, practically. <laughs> well, Yamuna Devi explains they made for weeks all these prasad apple preparations. And then very strategically, they stopped making. <laughs> And 
And the Beatles, where is our apple preparation? <laughs> so then they got notice and their relationship became very nice. And soon they were living in the house of John Lennon, who was the leader of the Beatles. And they invited Prabhupada. Well, even before they invited Prabhupada, when they were living with John Lennon and George Harrison was becoming so serious about Krishna consciousness, George heard them chanting and he was so enchanted by the chanting that he said, you should make a record. So they made a single 45 RPM record of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And that went into the public. It was a sensational hit. It was the number one record of all records. And this was in the 1960s when the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and all these different groups, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra by the devotees was number one. And it was in the top 10 for the whole of Europe. Incredible. So George was so inspired by this that he asked them to come to Apple Records to make a record album. And on that album, the lead song was Yamuna Devi singing Govindam Adipurusham Tamaham Bajami. Of course, Yamuna Devi was the lead singer for the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra also. And interestingly, when George Harrison, who was a topmost connoisseur of musical art for that genre of, art, of music, he, he was so deeply moved and impressed by Yamuna Devi's incredible voice, her stature, her charisma, her devotion, that he said, without any problem, we could make her one of the most famous singers in the entire world. And she could sing for Krishna. But Yamuna Devi, she didn't want to do that. She just wanted to serve her Gurudev and go wherever her Gurudev wanted her to go. She never wanted fame, she never wanted prestige, she just wanted to serve. The song Govindam Adi Purusham and the album was so, it was one of the biggest selling record albums in all of Europe. And at the time, Srila Prabhupada was in Los Angeles. We heard already from some of our most beloved speakers a little of the story. Srila Prabhupada wanted to hear the album, especially Govindam, in the L.A. temple. But the leaders, they refused to play it because it was sung by a female. And the brahmacharis might get offended. And the sannyasis might get angry. So Prabhupada said, play it. They said, no, no, we, we don't want to play it here. And he said, no, I want to hear it. And they said, we don't have a tape recorder. <laughs> we'll find one later. And it was just about the time, I think it was about the time for greeting the deities. And there was a, and there was a sound system in the temple rooms. Prabhupada said, play it in the sound system for the temple room. But Prabhupada, it's a woman singing. He said, Prabhupada said, play it. And when Jamuna's voice began, Govindam Adipurusham 
Tamaham Bajami. As it echoed through the temple, everyone was watching Srila Prabhupada's reaction. He closed his eyes in total silence, and a few seconds later, tears streamed from his eyes across his face. And he didn't say a word. Then everyone understood. Shri the Prabhupada's heart. And Prabhupada said, that this is a transcendental spiritual symphony from the spiritual world. And then he gave an order, an order nothing like it before or since. He ordered that every single temple of Iskan at the most intimate, special time of the day of greeting the deities that this song of Yamuna Devi and the devotees in London be played. And it's something absolutely universal. What can I say? That Hare Krishna mantra record that they made, it became so big, Mukunda Goswami explains, that the soccer team, Manchester United, they were playing. And during the break at halftime, they played this record for thousands and thousands of people and they were all chanting the Maha Mantra because it was like rooting the team on. This was the power of Yamuna Devi's magnetic voice. And Shamsundar Prabhu, so many times he told me that through these days which were very, very difficult in San Francisco and in London, they established a temple near the British Museum. They really reached out and made the Hare Krishna mantra an international known spiritual prayer. Srila Prabhupada said, I mean, Shamsundar Prabhu told us, I just spoke to him this morning actually. He said, we were going here and there and here and there. She said the, he said, the glue that held all of us together was Yamuna Devi. She had an incredible sense of humor, no false ego, but she was so deep and she was so grave and she was always so totally focused and centered in pure devotional service and nothing else. What they did in London was so historical. Srila Prabhupada's confidence in their commitment, their devotion, and their love was so great that he asked them to come to India. Gurudas, Yamuna, Shamsundar Malati, they came to India. First devotees to really help Prabhupada establish the movement. Yamuna Devi, for two years, she was Prabhupada's personal cook. And she went everywhere with him. And Srila Prabhupada taught her how to cook and had the best cooks teach her how to cook. Prabhupada's sister, Prabhupada himself. If they were, they, they would go to so many houses, Yadubar Prabhu could actually speak so much more because he has such deep relationship and realizations, but he's so humble, he only spoke a few words. But they were having programs at people's houses constantly, 
And if any preparation was really good, he would ask Yamuna, learn how to make this from them. In this way, she learned. And we heard from one of our devotees how Yamuna told this beautiful instruction that Prabhupada gave. If you do not teach other people to know what you did, what you have learned, then you will become proud. And I heard Yamuna Devi repeat these things so many times over the years because she understood this is so important. And she lived by it, absolutely. And it is crucial to our spiritual lives because the false ego, we want to be unique. We want to be able to say something, to do something that nobody else can do. That kind of puts us on a special pedestal. And we become proud. But whatever we know, if we just understand, it's been given to me, it's not mine. And my duty, my obligation is what I receive, I must give to others. So that they could do it too. And that really does cure our pride because then they could do it just as good as us. And hopefully, as far as pride goes, even better. This is leadership. Not to keep people down, but to push people up. Nothing is mine. It's been given to me by Prabhupada's grace, by Krishna's grace. This is the way it, Yamuna Devi is teaching us. Share it. Teach it extensively, every detail of it, so that everyone could do it. And then we could actually feel like humble servants and really please Krishna. She was so determined to please Prabhupada. She tells a story of once, you know, the devotees were really living in very austere conditions in India. And once they were on a train traveling with Srila Prabhupada. And she was Prabhupada's cook. Her and I believe Kosalya Devi. They traveled a lot with Prabhupada. And <clears throat> they want, they went to the kitchen of the train and asked if they could cook for their spiritual master. And the bureaucracy of India <laughs> some things are quite deeply rooted. They said, no, no one is allowed in the kitchen of the train. You cannot come. Oh, it's too, too white American girls are asking to go into the kitchen of the train. And this is a 1970, 71. So they refused. So they begged, they pleaded, but they absolutely refused. Yamuna Devi was so committed to make prasad for Prabhupada because Prabhupada was hungry. With firm determination, she said right to the head of the train, that if you don't let me in to cook for my spiritual master, then I will jump out of the train at this moment and you are responsible for my death. And she said it with such conviction, they trembled. <laughs> they opened the doors to the kitchen and said, cook, cook. <laughs> and they started calling her the crazy white lady. But she didn't care, whatever they called her. She only wanted to make sure that Prabhupada got his rice. Srila Prabhupada recognized that. And she traveled with Srila Prabhupada, Bombay, in Surat. She was leading kirtans, where there were thousands of people welcoming the devotees. 
Calcutta, Delhi, and ultimately Srila Prabhupada instructed Guru Das Prabhu and Yamuna Devi to take charge of Vrindavan, to build the Krishna Balaram temple in Vrindavan, to cultivate Iskan Bhakti in Vrindavan. And they did. And it was really difficult. When I lived in Vrindavan, there was only one or one other white person there. And we were just, you know, I was just sleeping on the river banks and just going to holy places and doing bhajan. And it was the most wonderful thing, but it wasn't easy. But can you imagine? Two Western American white people in 1971 who were given the task of building a magnificent temple and establishing, oh, establishing an entire movement full of challenges. Everyone wanted to cheat them. Everyone wanted to exploit them. Not everyone, but many. And they did it. Year after year after year, they struggled to establish the Krishna Balaram temple in Vrindavan against all odds. I'd like to say something about what Giriraj Maharaj spoke about in his offering. <clears throat> he, he explained how in 1971 Yamuna Devi would sit right in the front row as Srila Prabhupada would speak because she was so eager to hear every single word he would say. And they were at the Kumbh Mela in Allahabad. One sannyasi told her, this is India. Women cannot sit in the first row when a Swami is speaking. So she started to cry. Because in San Francisco, in London, and everywhere else, Srila Prabhupada gave her every facility and every opportunity to serve to her full heart's content. And Prabhupada only appreciated and encouraged her. So she went and sat back. And later, after the lecture, Prabhupada called for her. He said, don't you want to hear me speak anymore? Where were you? And she started crying again, and she told him what the sannyasi told her. And Srila Prabhupada didn't say anything. We heard this from Giriraj Swami Maharaj. So she realized that as the movement was growing, there were so many concerns and there was certain etiquette that she was going to have to follow, and that broke her heart. She realized she was going to have to serve Srila Prabhupada from a distance that was totally foreign and unknown to her. Now I'm going to give you a little, my own realization of what we have heard. Srila Prabhupada was asking why she wasn't there. If she asked Prabhupada's permission to sit in the front, it seems quite obvious he would have said yes. But she didn't, because she understood from his silence. But she would, so often, to myself and I would see to others, she would very much make sure that whatever she did, that Dina Tarani Devi did it with her. And she really took joy when people gave Dina Tarani Devi credit. 
because they had such pure spiritual love for each other. Jamuna Devi wrote me many letters and she always signed Dina Taradin's name with it. She didn't want to take any credit for anything herself. They were a team and whatever credit one had, they shared. And she was very much in that mood always. What a beautiful lesson that is for the world. If God brothers and God sisters could be so selfless and unconditional with Prabhupada and Krishna in the center, like they exemplified, this movement would be the all-attractive manifestation of Goloka Vrindavan. That's what their homes were, wherever they were. And that's what everyone felt when they came in contact with them. Yamuna Devi, in Prabhupada's service, wrote the most incredible cookbook in the history of Brahma's creation. <laughs> I think it was, what, 800 pages? And it's for the secular audience. And she's specifically glorifying Srila Prabhupada constantly. Who is Prabhupada? The nature of, her, of, her, of, of the guru-disciple relationship and how Prabhupada you know, taught her all these things. And it took her a long time. Yamuna Devi was a perfectionist in everything she did meticulously. She tried and tested every recipe and, and had people try every single recipe of that book. Was, was learned, was experimented, was tested, was proven many, many times before it could go into those pages. <clears throat> and everything was connected to Prabhupada and Krishna. She named it Lord Krishna's Cuisine. Doesn't get any more direct than that. She sent it publisher after publisher after publisher. Everyone rejected it. They didn't want it. Too long, too big. You have to take this out and take this out and this out. Then we will consider it. And people were advising Yamuna Devi, you have to revise it. She said, no, as it is. <laughs> that was the spirit, as it is. It was being rejected by every publisher it was being sent to. No, compromise or forget it. And finally, one publisher, a branch of Penguin, Dutton, they printed it. And that year, some of the most famous great authors of cookbooks wrote cookbooks. And Lord Krishna's cuisine won the most prestigious award, the International Cookbook of the Year. And it's simply an offering of her love for Prabhupada. What Srila Prabhupada gave her, according to his instruction, she was sharing with the whole world. And she was becoming very, very famous. But she didn't want fame. Only she wanted devotional service. Yadu Bar Prabhu was telling us about how she moved to Sharanagati.
she, her and Dina Tarani Devi, I may be criticized for saying this, but in my own heart, they're kind of like the Rupa and Sanatan Goswami of ladies in ISKCON today. <laughs> they're just incredible personalities. I'm happy if people criticize me for saying it. <laughs> Yamuna Devi looks like she's laughing at me. That's good enough. They built straw bale house out of natural products. And you know, we built natural houses in our farm at Govardhan, in Wada. But they live in Canada. It's about five hours from the closest city. And it's covered with snow and freezing cold in the winter. And there's bears all over the place. Yes? It's a very austere place. And they lived there. It was like, it was like an incredible bhajan kutir. And if you go there, it was the spiritual world. They designed that little bhajan kutir. It was beautiful. Meticulously, it was so simple. But every molecular particle was surcharged with their devotion. Everybody could feel it. Nothing was superficial for Yamuna Devi. Everything had a meaning, had a purpose. I used to just examine and just look at every detail. The altar. There was just little places, special places for, for Prabhupada's remnants special places for everything that belonged to the deities, special places for everything. Their deity worship was meticulous with artistic, loving devotion in every sense, as was their cooking. One time I went there to Shadarnagati, and Malati Devi and Shamsundar, we decided to go, and somehow or other, Yamuna Devi and Malati Devi convinced Janaki to take a long drive, even with her very, very ill health, to come and join us there. And of course, Yadubar Prabhu and Vishaka Devi were there. And we had prasad together. You were at that lunch, yes? You weren't there, okay. How many of you have had Yamuna Devi's prasad? When Dina Tarani Devi and Yamuna Devi cooked, it was a devotional masterpiece. <laughs> Really, Ekavir Prabhu, he just said it better than I've, anybody could say it. Everything, the way they cut the vegetables, the way they cooked it, the way they kept everything so absolutely spotlessly clean, even an atheist would have complete faith that this is Radharani's kitchen. <laughs> Seriously. That's the way they prepared everything. And the way they made the plates and the way they served it. Ekavir Prabhu said, when the plate came, what to speak of the things on the plate, the plate itself. He didn't want to eat it. It was almost like an offense to eat it. <laughs> Should like you should you know preserve it forever and put it on the altar and worship it. But it tasted so good that there was there was no way you could possibly not eat it. <laughs> and she was making. I never had this in my life to this day. She was she had about. 
six different flavored chapatis. Incredible. I wish I could remember all the flavors. They were like mango chapatis. All different flavored chapatis. <clears throat> And each one was so absolutely flaky and tender and delicious in texture, in, in the shape, in the design, in, the, in everything. And they were just making and making. And as we're sitting, we were asking, because I was supposed to give a lecture that night. And I said, this is such a historical event. When was the last time that Shamsundar, Malati, Jamuna, and Janaki were all together in the same place, these four Prabhus? I said, please, let's have a program tonight where all of you speak about Srila Prabhupada. And they said, no, 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 you speak. I said, please, 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 you know, I can speak any time. I'll speak tomorrow. He said, I, you know, I'm dying of thirst to hear all of the four of you here speak together. So say, and everybody else will. So, for, and Janaki Devi, she said, no, I have not spoken in public for 30 years, something like that, right? Since uh, about 1970 or something. She said, I have not spoken in public. I'm, there's so many devotees here, I will not do it. And I said, just sitting at the table, taking prasad, you've been sharing so many stories about Prabhupada. Just whatever you said to us, say it. She said, no, no, you're my close friends. We're sitting at a table together, but I can't do it in front of an audience. And then Yamuna Devi said, just pretend that it's just us at the table and just speak. <laughs> and ultimately, only Yamuna Devi could convince her younger sister to agree, to break out of that 30 years of isolation in preaching Krishna consciousness and Prabhupada's glories. So Janaki Devi finally agreed. But then Jamuna Devi said, but the three of them will speak, I'm not going to speak. <laughs> I said, what is this? You know, that's the four of you. She said, how can I speak? I live here. It's presumptuous when all these guests are here that I speak. So somehow or other went back and forth and because everybody wanted her to speak, she, she surrendered. And that was such a beautiful historical event. You videotaped it, didn't you? It was absolutely incredible. Sham Sundar Prabhu is just so expert at just churning the nectar from people's hearts. And I was just so amazed to see the dynamics between these three sisters, Dina Tarani Devi, Yamuna Devi, and Janaki Devi. It's quite, the dynamics are quite inconceivable. Um, I, I, it's getting very late, I'm sorry. We are so blessed in this very temple room on several occasions Yamuna Devi spoke for us sitting right here in Yadubar Prabhu's chair she would lead kirtans she would speak incredible deep memories of Srila Prabhupada she would speak such powerful pure heart-piercing siddhanta of our teachings and our philosophy. 
with such compassion. And that miraculous event was already explained For people who only hear this tape, I will just repeat it because it was so inconceivable. Yamuna Devi was here, and it was the greeting of the deities time, and we were all sitting in front of the doors, and the doors opened, and just as the doors opened, the electricity went out. So Govinda Mari Purusham didn't play. There was no electricity. So everyone looked at Yamuna Devi. And I asked her, please, you, know, you chant. She said, no, no. And everyone was looking at her, please chant. So she led live in person for the greetings of Radha Gopinath. Govindam Adipurusham Tamaham Bajami. And I, I was just thinking that devotees all over the universe would give anything to be here for this moment. Where Yamuna Devi is live in person greeting the deities. And the most, it was very heart melting. As soon as she ended, all the lights went on and the electricity came back. This is not just some sentimental idea. This is the reality that Sri Sri Radha Gopinath, they wanted her to sing for them. And they orchestrated it perfectly. And we were all the witnesses of this Leela. During the Pune Yatra, Yamuna Devi, Dina Tarani Devi, they came. How many of you were there for that? For several days. And how much they encouraged us to see all the enthusiasm for chanting and for dancing. And in their honor, because they are such great renunciates, I don't know how many hours I spoke about Lord Chaitanya's sannyas pastimes. And somehow or other, like a mother encourages a little child, they encouraged me to just keep speaking. It meant so much to me that I could actually please them just by my insignificant attempts. And that's a special message. Whatever our position is in Krishna consciousness, the nectar of devotion is when we really try to please those people who we feel are so close to our Gurudev.